So I moved out of New York at about 20 years ago, and I'm not moving back. But if I did, it would be because I'd gotten a call from CB Insights, and I, I'm not asking, I promise, and, and that they had wanted me to help with their daily newsletters about their private investment market. And that's because for those of you who get them, you know that they look at the data, but then they deliver on a take on a category or a trend across all kinds of markets that puts wisdom and context and personality and even a little bit of humanity into what would ordinarily be a stack of compiled SEC and press release data. As we've seen the scramble of tech money, private equity, corporate venture capital into the food space, the team at CB Insights has followed them, giving glimpses of the powerful subscription-based capabilities of their platform. Zoe Levitt, is the point person for CB Insights food practice. And I've asked her here for two reasons. One is so that I could finally meet her, and also so that she could give us a high-level look at the way institutions and strategics are investing in entrepreneurial food companies. Please welcome Zoe Levitt. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'll be going through a very high level view of investment priorities and high momentum startups um, in a short amount of time. So I'll be happy to share these slides with anyone afterwards if you're interested. Um, so today, we see the uh, global incumbent food industry facing two major long-term concerns. One is that the food products that we buy are changing. On a very high level, the global population is growing, on track to reach 10 billion people within just a few decades. And uh, assuming Elon Musk doesn't get us all to Mars first, we're going to need a way to feed all these people. We also need to reduce food waste um, and uh, react to climate change, which can impact, negatively impact the yields of our existing uh, food production uh, supply chains. Also, I think uh, I can confidently say for all of us in this room whose basic needs are met, we're asking for more out of our food products. We don't just want something that's going to fill us up in the moment. We want something that's going to improve our digestive health, improve our mental capabilities, and get us to 150 years old while still maintaining great hair and skin quality. And then on a much more short-term, concrete level, for major uh, food leaders like Nestle, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, they're increasingly threatened by grocery chains' private label products. Uh, Albertsons, Kroger, Walmart have all promised to invest heavily in their private label brands over the next few years. And of course, Amazon, uh, which has released their Happy Belly private label food brand and others, is becoming a stronger and stronger direct competitor to, uh, to the food brands that we're used to. And at the same time, uh, the impact uh, from below, the impact of startups, as all of us here in this room know, cannot be ignored. Um, among the two most notable examples, uh, Chobani, of course, a startup, became uh, the top-selling yogurt brand in America in 2016. And in 2017, Halo Top became uh, the top-selling pint of ice cream in American grocery stores, threatening Unilever and other incumbents. And there are more competitors on the way. Um, here's just a highlight of, of uh, a, few, a few dozen of some uh, high momentum food startups that are threatening uh, Unilever, Nestle, and uh, major companies. So while the, food, the types of food that we buy, both on a long-term level and on a short-term level, are changing, the ways we uh, discover and access those food products is also going through an evolution. Um, I think it's no surprise to any of us in this room that brick-and-mortar retail has been struggling over the past few years. We've seen the bankruptcies among, uh, mainly among mid-priced apparel, uh, mall-based retailers uh, multiply over the past few years. And while this hasn't uh, hit grocery in an incredibly meaningful way yet, it likely will over the next five or so years. 
um, partially because grocery shoppers around the world are moving online. America's actually behind countries like South Korea, China, and the UK in this respect. Um, and of course, again, Amazon is uh, increasingly the channel that, from which we buy groceries. Uh, now they own Whole Foods, uh, knocking out some of the traditional channels like Walmart, Kroger, et cetera. So in the face of all this change, uh, both venture capital and strategic investors are coming in. Uh, we've seen, uh, well, overall food uh, funding to food, private food companies has been a bit uneven over the past few years. We do see a notable long-term growth in attention to the food and beverage sector, growth in funding and in deal count. And one of the major drivers here is that new investors are flocking to the food and beverage space. This is no longer a niche sector within the world of Silicon Valley. We're seeing a whole range of uh, both new investors spring up specifically to focus on food and beverage, as well as uh, more uh, traditional venture capital players that may previously have invested in software products, uh, consumer electronics, now looking to food and beverage. Uh, so some of the leading uh, venture capital firms focused on food and beverage, probably familiar names to uh, many of us in this room, include s to g Ventures, New Crop Capital. Uh, we're also seeing, again, t even uh, technology companies moving into the food and beverage space. Uh, through its venture arm, Google Ventures, uh, Google has invested in a number of agriculture technology and consumer packaged goods uh, startups. And of course, um, in the face of these threats to their traditional business models, major food companies are beginning to launch their own investment vehicles to try to get a piece of this pie and access some of the innovation of startups, discover the future halo tops, the future Chobanis of the world. Um, so this has been a bit of a domino effect over the past two years or so. We can see um, alcohol companies got there relatively earlier uh, with Anheuser-Busch, Diageo launching venture funds, uh, and more recently, Campbell's Soup, General Mills, uh, Tyson, et cetera. So where the, uh, now we'll take a look at where some of these major food leaders are focusing their investment dollars. And we do see a range of strategies. Uh, General Mills 301 Inc., for example, has focused mainly on uh, packaged products with a focus on plant protein. Uh, we can see their investments here. Uh, Campbell Soup, on the other hand, through its Acre Venture Partners uh, Fund, has focused more on supply chain and behind-the-scenes food safety startups. Uh, for example, one of their portfolio companies, Impact Vision, uses a specto spectrography to uh, monitor food safety uh, visually and be able to uh, uh, track the nutrition of food pro nutritional quality of food products throughout the supply chain. Uh, they've also co-invested with Google in Farmers Business Network, uh, which is a network for farmers uh, focused on, on the improving the agriculture industry. Um, Cargill, one of the leading meat companies, has uh, made an interesting range of bets, both in improving the uh, safety and quality of their current meat products, uh, including launching a blockchain initiative to trace the international supply chains of some of their meat products, as well as uh, making an investment in uh, a drone, drone technology startup, which focuses on tracking climate change and helping uh, agricultural producers prepare for uh, global warming. They've also begun to hedge their bets a little bit, preparing for a world that's less focused on animal meat and more focused on plant protein, as well as lab-grown meat, uh, entering a joint venture with uh, North America's largest pea protein producer, Puris, as well as uh, investing in Memphis Meat, so one of the leading lab-grown meat startups. Tyson Foods, another leading meat company, has also invested in Memphis Meats, as well as Beyond Meat, uh, one of the leading plant protein startups, and also Tovala, which is a, uh, a direct-to-consumer meal delivery service with a paired connected steam oven. Uh, so we can see they are also, similarly to Cargill, hedging their bets a bit, preparing for a world that's less focused on animal meat, but also looking at new distribution methods, new ways to get directly into consumers' homes without relying on the intermediaries of traditional grocery stores. Um, of course, uh, talking about uh, investments and acquisitions in the startup world, certainly have to mention uh, the Nestle and Jab coffee war that's been brewing over the past uh, couple years. Uh, most recently, actually, Jab, uh, J-A-B, which is a German holding company, um, acquired pre a manager just the other day, um, so that you may have seen these headlines. But over the past few years, J-A-B has built up a major coffee empire. Uh, they own uh, now Pete's Coffee, Einstein Brothers, Keurig, Krispy Kreme, etc. Um, threatening Nestle, one of the world's leading, uh, leading coffee 
brands, and Nestle has been upping their startup uh, investment and acquisition activity in response, acquiring Blue Bottle, acquiring Chameleon Cold Brew, and other moves. So in the face of all this uh, increased competition, as more food companies launch venture funds, as acquisitions heat up, startups are looking to form stronger relationships with the most promising startups earlier and earlier. To, uh, so, so for example, Nestle could uh, discover the coffee startup before JAB gets a hold of it. Um, so we are seeing uh, some companies, including Tyson and Nestle, start to partner with incubator programs. So this is before the startup is ready for that venture investment, they can make these very small, kind of low commitment uh, bets on very early stage startups and then uh, turn that into a stronger relationship if the startup does continue to grow. We even see uh, former startups getting into the mix. Uh, Chobani has a food incubator program that's backed a range of not just yogurt startups, but uh, juice startups, beverage startups, uh, even Love the Wild, a seafood startup. Um, so now, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll look at what uh, some of the large-scale priorities of uh, these uh, venture and strategic investors. And these fall into three main groups. One is improved food products, uh, so new food products themselves, adapting to shift, uh, shifting consumer trends that are more focused on healthy products, more focused on uh, transparent and sustainably sourced food products, as well as plant protein. Uh, they're also looking at new agricultural strategies, um, a slightly different uh, sometimes a different type of investor focused on the agriculture side versus the uh, end uh, consumer facing product side. And they're also looking at improved uh, tech enabled distribution methods to, uh, to begin to bypass brick and mortar grocery stores in case uh, those do fall victim to the growing retail apocalypse going forward uh, and even uh, prepare for uh, competition from Amazon and other major tech and e-commerce players. Uh, so starting with the improved food products, um, here the next few slides show notable startups that have raised venture investment over the past two years. Uh, we see pea protein is a, a notable ingredient on the rise with some high momentum examples here. Uh, Beyond Meat, a leading uh, plant protein startup that I'm sure you've seen in stores, relies on pea protein, uh, as does Ripple, a pea protein-based milk product that's still sold in grocery stores across the country, and even uh, direct protein powders, even ice cream substitutes. Uh, we also see some momentum in uh, mushrooms, which can uh, add a, a healthy plant-based source of protein, as well as uh, even uh, be adapted to make products taste sweeter. Um, Kellogg's, interestingly, they, they, didn't, they don't have a uh, consumer-facing product, but so it didn't quite fit on this slide, uh, but Kellogg's has actually invested in a mushroom protein startup called Mycotechnology that uh, adapts mushroom proteins to uh, create bitter blockers uh, that blo reduce the bitter taste on your tongue to make things taste sweeter without adding extra calories. Um, so these are some interesting uh, new uses for uh, some plant products that may have been underestimated in the past. Uh, we also see startups, uh, startups and uh, strategic investors looking toward more uh, healthy, healthy fruit-based uh, sweeteners to reduce sugar content. Um, a few high momentum examples include uh, Moringa, Maca, uh, Monk Fruit being used by uh, the startups you see here to make their products taste sweeter while still emphasizing their plant, uh, their plant-based ingredient list. And then, of course, as uh, cannabis is increasingly legalized throughout the U.S., this will have a major impact on food brands. Um, the reason Corona's up here on this slide is their parent company has already invested in a marijuana startup. Um, and we do see companies both uh, integrating cannabis into uh, packaged food products, as we can see on this slide, as well as uh, companies, uh, alcohol companies, um, looking to uh, perhaps hedge their bets a bit if, uh, if this does uh, continue to take off. Looking further out, um, we see lab-grown meat as one of the uh, most significant trends in the overall food and beverage space. As we just saw earlier, even traditional meat companies like Cargill and Tyson are getting on board with this trend, uh, trying to co-opt it rather than putting their head in the sand and uh, potentially being eliminated by this trend 10, uh, 20, 30 years out. Uh, so Memphis Meats is one of the leaders here um, in, in growing meat in the lab. Um, they've already been able to reduce the price of lab-grown meat pretty significantly. And and uh, if price reductions continue with their current rate, we could see this meat hitting our tables by uh, potentially 2021. 
Uh, other startups are working on lab-grown seafood, uh, for example, Finless Foods, which says that uh, the energy required to grow fish proteins in a lab is, uh, is less than the energy required for red meat. Uh, so they believe that fish, lab-grown fish, will actually be one of the first products that we see coming from the lab, despite the um, greater press attention that's gone to lab-grown meat. Um, so we see that. Uh, we see startups looking to replace animal proteins uh, through lab-grown uh, processes. Uh, it, uh, focused on uh, more behind-the-scenes products, such as gelatin uh, with Geltor, and dairy proteins, um, such as uh, startup Perfect Day is a leader there. Um, and Perfect Day does have an interesting uh, business model, I think. It actually, um, one of the lines in the Cool House presentation that we saw earlier reminded me of Perfect Day, since they did start uh, with the idea that they'd become a consumer-facing brand, selling uh, lab-grown milk products, but then pivoted to a B2B model. Um, so they now plan to provide their lab-grown dairy proteins to larger cheese producers, milk producers, uh, pizza producers. Uh, so similarly to uh, the discussion of, of Cool House uh, potentially serving, uh, off, focusing on office catering rather than selling products one at a time to consumers. I think this, uh, this shows that this B2B pivot can be valuable for uh, food startups. So now take a look at some of the major themes in uh, startups improving our current agricultural processes to adapt to global climate change and uh, ensure we have enough, enough uh, healthy food to feed our growing uh, world population. Agricultural startups have also been a hot area for investors over the past uh, few years with over $2 billion going into the sector. Um, we can see over 100 of those startups here. Um, and they focus on a few areas. Some of them focus on uh, automation to uh, improve the efficiency of, uh, of uh, crop, of harvesting, um, and somewhat uh, perhaps perversely, but the current uh, difficulty in the uh, immigration landscape actually may be helping some of these uh, robotic harvesting startups gain more of a foothold as labor potentially is harder to come by. Uh, so we see startups like Abundant Robotics, which is working on uh, robots for apple picking. Uh, we also see startups like um, Aware and Hortal, which focus on helping farmers uh, reduce their energy and water usage, so improving the environment while also saving costs for the farmers. Uh, major technology companies are also playing here. Uh, perhaps most notably, uh, Jeff Bezos and SoftBank recently invested $200 million into Plenty, an indoor farming startup based in San Francisco that uh, here, um, these startups play, uh, indoor farming startups do play off a few trends. Uh, one, shortening the supply chain, uh, so maintaining uh, Increasing transparency, uh, helping consumers feel like they're uh, buying local food, they know where that food comes from. Uh, of course, increasing efficiency. Uh, indoor farming uses up to 95% less water and less energy to grow a similar amount of crops. And since it's such a controlled environment, indoor farming startups can literally boost uh, the taste and nutritional value of the food products that they grow. Uh, right for the time being, many focus on leafy greens uh, due to energy and, uh, and sort of operational constraints, but they could expand into other types of fruits and vegetables in the future. Uh, we've also seen uh, Google, as I mentioned earlier, and even Alibaba invest in the agriculture space. Uh, besides Plenty, uh, ind the indoor farming startup I was just discussing, we see other, uh, other emerging players to watch, including Aero Farms, Freight Farms, um, and one, uh, one of the additional benefits of indoor farming startups is that retailers that sell products, new uh, fruits and vegetables grown in unique new ways, then have a story to tell about that brand, to turn about that food product, to turn uh, the apple or the spinach that was previously a commodity into a more unique product. So uh, we also see retailers, grocery retailers, looking to vertically integrate their supply chain so they too can uh, boast about uh, the sustainability and transparency transparency of the fruits and vegetables they're selling. On this note, um, a, bit, a bit out there, uh, but Walmart recently applied for a patent on a robotic bees. Uh, since global bee populations are in trouble, Walmart is looking for more efficient ways to pollinate crops. Uh, this could signal uh, Walmart's interest in vertical integration and in moving themselves into farming in the future, besides being uh, a bit dystopian and reminiscent of a Black Mirror plot. Um, 
So I'll then uh, close out by looking at some of the improved distribution methods that both uh, leading food brands and startups are looking to bypass traditional grocery stores, uh, attract shoppers, differentiate themselves, and uh, make it as convenient as possible for shoppers to get their hands on their products. In terms of sustainability and transparency, blockchain is a, a major buzzword. You may have heard of it across pretty much every industry. Um, and IBM has led a consortium, uh, including Nestle, Dole, Walmart, uh, and other major food companies to pilot programs uh, to trace uh, the food products on the blockchain. Um, so actually, this did recently get a boost uh, based on the uh, recent E. coli outbreak in America um, through, from uh, lettuce that sickened a few dozen people. Uh, Walmart has come out vocally to say they consider their blockchain pilot a success, that they now, uh, it's reduced the time it takes to track a specific product um, that was sold in a store that may have been infected by E. coli, that they don't, they pre it previously would take them over a week to figure out exactly which farm that product may have come from, what other products might be impacted. That's valuable time wasted when people may be getting sick. It might have culminated in them having to recall all lettuce or romaine lettuce from their shelves or something like that. Now, uh, according to Walmart, in just seconds on the blockchain, uh, they can track where exactly where that product came from and pilot there uh, and target any uh, product recalls or apology marketing campaigns uh, that they may need to do much more carefully. Uh, we also see startups using biotech to uh, improve the, uh, to protect the products themselves during their journey on the supply chain. Appeal is uh, one of the leading players here, backed by Andreessen Horowitz with over $40 million in funding. Appeal uses uh, the uh, food-based uh, byproducts to create a tasteless, invisible coating uh, that, can be, uh, that can cover fruits and vegetables post-harvest and extend their shelf life for, uh, for several weeks. Uh, they have patented this process and have begun to roll it out on avocados, uh, which they say the, uh, the surface area to cost ratio is most appealing there. We know how popular avocados are, um, so if they can help farmers uh, make those avocados last longer, get to a wider range of millennials around the world, this will, uh, this will help both the farmers and the end consumer. Um, so as I've mentioned repeatedly, uh, more uh, food brands are looking for new, uh, not just e-commerce, but also innovative new offline ways to get their products into consumers' hands without waiting for those consumers to come to them in the grocery store aisles. So a few, few of the models uh, that I'm most excited about uh, right now include office distribution. Um, Snack Nation is a very interesting player here. Uh, they distribute, they work with emerging uh, startup food brands as well as uh, major food players that may want to test out new flavors and distribute those products to offices, test, let them test the new flavors on the employees in the office, gather data, help them refine and iterate on their product. Um, so this is a way to introduce new people to, to, uh, to your food product while also gathering, uh, having sort of a closed, uh, secure focus group a focus group environment. Um. We also see, uh, based here in New York, Cargo is a startup that's installing mini kiosks, as you can see here, inside Uber cars, selling snacks and drinks uh, that you can grab while you ride. Uh, they've, they already work with uh, Kellogg's, Mars, uh, they've received investment from uh, Kellogg's and a few other major food leaders. Um, so this, uh, again, helps uh, food companies get their products into people's hands in a very convenient and natural way, but also helps those food brands collect data on uh, people's purchasing habits. Uh, because uh, the cargo kiosks are mobile operated. So once you're paying with mobile phone to open, open the kiosk, grab your snack, that brand then has access to data about you that if you were just paying, uh, paying a couple dollars in cash for your gum at the uh, corner store, that brand would not be able to have. Um, so that's another interesting model. Um, we also see, uh, particularly in China, this mobile payment model really taking off and collecting so much, vast amounts more data for brands because uh, once they have access to your mobile phone, they have access to your life. Um, so we do see this rise of automated uh, vending machines and even fully automated stores comparable to Amazon Go in the U.S. Uh, already, uh, already on the ground running in China. 
Uh, we also see how improved distribution methods can become part of the story of the product. Uh, Zoom Pizza, based in Palo Alto, is a rapidly growing startup that uh, has installed robots in the back of delivery trucks. So the robots can uh, automatically prepare personalized pizzas while the truck is driving to the consumer's home. The pizza then arrives freshly baked, fresh out of the oven, um, and gives them a great story that this is a pizza uh, prepared by a robot. Uh, Walmart has also looked into installing uh, perhaps 3D printers or even small indoor farms growing herbs in the back of delivery trucks. Um, so this is, again, another way to get a very uh, creative, engaging uh, uh, products with engaging backgrounds into the hands of shoppers without waiting for them to come to the grocery store. Uh, to take it even further, companies like Procter & Gamble are looking into automated, uh, automated ref refills of products. Um, so this cuts out not only the retailer, but also, or not only any need for the shopper to go to a grocery store, to go to a retailer, but even any need for the shopper to go to a website. Uh, Procter & Gamble has looked at uh, tagging product packages with uh, connected uh, IoT tags that would sense when that product is used up and automatically place an order uh, for a refill. So this locks the shopper into your brand, also of course collects huge amounts of data on product usage habits. And when we look at how this could ultimately play out, Amazon of course um, is always one to watch. Um, Amazon has looked into uh, not only predicting, uh, predicting when shoppers will need certain products on an individual level, but also on a neighborhood level and adapting not only uh, the last mile delivery, but even the storage of the products to uh, shifting supply and demand in real time. Uh, so they've patented uh, these, uh, again, very dystopian looking uh, flying warehouses that could uh, sense shifting demand uh, for specific products on the ground. Uh, for example, the patent talks about uh, maybe a football game scale going on, they can stock up the, uh, the flying warehouse with jerseys, hot dogs, popcorn, fly it towards the stadium, shuttle, and then use smaller drones to shuttle those products down to shoppers on the ground in real time. Um, so, when we, so this is um, maybe not something Amazon's planning to do in the near future, but does show how companies are looking at these new distribution methods that are much more adaptive and much more focused on collecting personal data from shoppers and integrating that throughout the whole supply chain. Um, so looking forward, companies will need to focus on not only uh, health and convenience, but also data gathering and personalization to compete with these major players. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. We have time for just one quick oh. question. Um, at what point do you think the Amazon dirigible will be attacked by Walmart's robot bees? <laughs> that is a great question. That's what uh, I guess, you know, we often at CB Insights, we talk about death by a thousand cuts that big companies might face from startups. I think that, <laughs> death that by could a be thousand the bees versus the original. Yeah. Um, seriously, one quick question. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's your assessment of how smart the money that's flowing in is right now. Looks like they've really spread their bets very widely. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, this, in my opinion, the smartest bets are those that focus on, the smartest strategic bets are those that focus on real long-term foundational changes for the business, not simply tacking on a new product line, uh, maybe acquiring a small startup that has uh, an interesting product is great, but that's, a much, that's gonna provide much shorter term benefit to um, the Campbell Soup, the General Mills, versus investing more heavily in uh, their supply chain, in uh, you know, data, uh, kind of uh, consumer analytics, things like that, that can shift the entire uh, business model rather than adding a new product. So if you're in the uh, sort of improved food product space, as I, I think many of the people here are, how long do you think that they have to kind of take advantage of this booming market? I mean, these are slow moving companies, certainly, certainly plenty of time. Um, but I would say it's not, when these investors are considering companies, it's not enough just to have a great new product. You also need to have a creative, innovative distribution channel that those companies think we can, uh, we can use this brand to pilot this new, this new distribution channel, see how it plays out, and then potentially implement it throughout our, uh, the rest of our business. All right, great, great. points. Thank you Thank so you. much, Zoe. Thank